Hey guys, I'm Brian with Next Level Gardening and you are here on a good day because today we are kicking off the highly anticipated series, building a garden from scratch for free. Highly anticipated, makes me a little nervous. So this is gonna be every Sunday for the next four Sundays and then monthly check-ins to see how things are going. So make sure you hit subscribe, turn on the bell so you get notified every time one of these videos comes out. I'm also gonna be doing extra videos this year that are related. Uh, using and repurposing things you already have, cheap or free garden hacks, and even making your own free fertilizer. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to the free rule. Uh, if you live somewhere that's dry in the summer and you have to water, you're going to have to pay for water. There's nothing I can do about that. And unless you have really, really gigantic hands, you're probably going to need a shovel. But other than that, I'm going to show you how to do everything else to start a garden and grow a garden for free. Seeds, compost, fertilizer, and of course companion planting so we don't have to buy and use herbicides or pesticides. So are you ready to get started? Let's get growing. So the first thing you have to figure out when you're starting a new garden is where you're going to put it. Now I'm putting mine in a cottage garden. This was full of cactus and succulents 16 months ago and last summer I had a few pumpkins up here but that's it. This is a great location for me, but let's go over the four things so you can check off the list to make sure you have a great location at your house. The first thing you need to consider is convenience, location. It really should be close to your home, especially the kitchen, since we're growing vegetables, fruits, and herbs. Uh, if I lived in this cottage right here, this would be the perfect spot. I don't live too far away. The house is just right there, and that's the kitchen window. So have them as close to the house as possible so you can run out and get what you need when you need it. Also, your garden should be on flat ground or a gentle slope. That'll help with watering and it will even out any low cold areas when it comes to uh, a place where frost might gather. Cold air sinks, so you want to avoid putting your garden at the bottom of a slope. So if any frost happens on that particular day or night, it's mostly gonna be in that area. So keep your garden above that. Now for more tender plants, if you put part of your garden against a south facing wall or a north facing wall in the southern hemisphere, the wall is going to collect the heat from the sun during the day and radiate it out to your plants at night. In order to thrive and produce as expected, most vegetables need lots of sun. So the sunnier the location, the better. Now ideally your garden location should provide your crops with eight hours of sun, six at a minimum, direct sun. Now those hours don't need to be consecutive. If you get two hours in the morning, four hours in the afternoon, but it's shaded midday, that's good. And remember that seasons change the shadows in your garden. So if you're near a house, a wall, or a fence, it could be shaded in the winter. This is half day of shade here in the winter, but full day of sun in the summertime. It's important to consider the location of your water source when planting a garden. Nothing's gonna tire you out faster than hauling water back and forth to your garden. Also keep in mind that gardens near large trees will have to compete with the trees for water. So it's best to locate your garden in an open area and away from any trees that might be drinking up hundreds of gallons of water each day. This spot meets all those requirements. No big trees, sun when I need it, close to a water source, at the top of a sloping area. Now let's decide on in-ground beds versus raised beds. Raised beds can be made from anything, rocks, old bricks, fallen tree trunks or logs, pallet wood, scrap metal, reclaimed wood, anything. If you have access to scrap or reclaimed wood, or if you're lucky and have, a, have access to free new wood, I'll put a link in the description how to make these simple, cheap raised beds. Now, raised beds have some advantages. Uh, number one is you tend not to walk in them as much when they're raised up versus level with the ground, and so you get less compaction. Raised beds warm up quicker than in-ground beds in the springtime, and so that in and of itself lengthens your growing season. And for whatever reason, there is less weeding in a raised bed. And you can plant more things because they have a deep root run. You can plant things closer together, so more plants per square foot. Now there's times when raised beds are necessary. If you have contaminated soil, or if you're gardening on a cement slab like I used to, you're gonna need raised beds. Now advantages of growing directly in the ground, even if the materials are free, you don't have to build anything. It takes less water because the roots can just go down a little deeper if they're looking for more moisture. I'm gonna do a hybrid of the two. It's a raised row method. 
I'm gonna build up rows of compost right here on top of my native soil. And that is going to, number one, get, give me that better drainage I'm looking for. It's also going to help them warm up more quickly in spring so I can plant earlier. To do this, I'm gonna be using compost, which I got for free. Now, later in the season, I'm gonna show you how to build your own free compost bins. So you'll be able to make your own nutritious compost. But of course, we need it right now, so that's not gonna help at the moment. So how do you get free compost? Check with your county or city. If they have a yard waste recycling program, they probably offer free compost to you as a citizen. Another way is to look up a local mushroom farm. That's what I did. Mushroom farms only use compost for one batch of mushrooms, and then they scoop it all away and offer it for free generally to the general public. So take your truck, borrow a truck from a friend, shovel your own, bring it home, and you've got really great compost to use, maybe. The first year I did this, I had an issue with my seedlings. Uh, well, first of all, the seeds didn't germinate very quickly. And then it, when they did, they all looked burned. I didn't know it at the time, but I learned the hard way that sometimes mushroom compost can be salty. Now you can buy a cheap salinity test or just plant some bean seeds. They should come up in about a week. If it takes much longer than that, you might have an issue. And if they come up and they look burned, probably got a salt issue. Now it's not difficult or even time consuming to take care of your salt issue. Really soak that compost with water at least once a day, maybe twice a day for a week. That's gonna help flush that salt down deeper into the soil. If you have a little money to spend, you can buy some gypsum, which is very cheap. Sprinkling that very liberally across the compost and then watering it in, that's gonna probably cut your leach time in half. One much more difficult issue is grazon in your compost. Grazon is a broadleaf herbicide and it's used uh, a lot of times on hay, hay fields, so it doesn't hurt the hay as a grass, but it will kill all the weeds. The problem with that is if hay was used in making that compost and it has grazon in it, that's a problem. Or if manure was used in that compost and the cows or horses had been eating hay that was contaminated with grazon, that grazon goes right through their digestive system and back into that manure. The thing about grazon is it takes three years to leave your soil if it has it in it. But very similarly to the salt test, um, plant some corn and beans in your compost before spreading it out. Give them some time to uh, germinate. If you see that the corn doesn't have any issues, but the beans are kind of curled up and disfigured, that is a very good sign that you have grazon. And you don't wanna use that compost for three years. Now I would say more often than not, you're not gonna have any of these issues, but it's nice to know in advance to check so you don't make the same mistake I did. Ah, <sighs> grazon. That's the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. That it is, Eddie. That it is. Now growing your crops in compost is going to give them pretty much all the nutrients they need, at least for the first couple of months. At that time, you're going to need to add fertilizer to get the most out of your crops. So coming soon in one of our videos, I'm gonna show you how to take things you have around your house and make fertilizer out of it. All right, I've got all the debris and leaves and things cleared out of here, it's flattened out. I'm gonna set up my raised rows here made out of the mushroom compost and I'm gonna have them go in a north-south direction. Now, this is not uh, imperative that you do north-south, but the idea behind north-south is that as the, as the sun rises in the east and travels over the garden to the west, it's gonna be able to hit both sides of every row so everything gets good coverage. Now, before you start to lay the compost out, decide if you have weeds or not. If not, go ahead and lay the compost down on the soil. If you do have weeds, or even a full lawn, you don't have to take up the lawn. Just mow them all short, lay a couple sheets of cardboard over the lawn or the weeds, wet it down, and then pile at least six inches of compost on top. That will create a weed barrier that will eventually disintegrate after killing the grass and weeds, and the worms will take it down into the soil and turn it into something really great. You only want to use regular cardboard that isn't shiny. Shiny cardboard has plastics and wax in them. And you want to remove the tape if you can, but if you can't, it's okay. You just might be picking it out of your compost after the cardboard disintegrates. 
sometimes that could be easier. It's not a big deal. So we've got our rows ready. Two to three feet wide is ideal for most crops, and I've left one to two foot paths between them. You can leave the paths with the cardboard showing or do like I did and cover it with the wood chips. Again, check with your city or county if they have a recycling program, they might have mulch also. If not, you can go to chipdrop.com. That is basically tree trimmers who go there to find a match for someone looking for the trees that they just shredded up. So they don't have to take it to the landfill, they can just drop it off at your house for free. Now this mulch is from some trees uh, that we had cut down a year or so ago and a nice two to three inch layer works best. All right, the last thing to talk about today is getting your seeds. Could be a big expense, but it doesn't have to be. Now, it may not be time for you to start planting in your area. We'll discuss that on the next video next Sunday, but you need to get your seeds now to be ready. And especially if you're going after free seeds, it takes a little bit longer to just try to locate them than just going online or going through a catalog and placing an order. Now, I will say if you have a little money to spend, uh, a lot of people ask if Dollar Tree seeds are any good. Dollar Tree seeds are totally fine. Uh, I think it's about 50 cents a seed pack there. And yeah, there's, they're not going to be much different than any other seeds you're going to get. And by the way, there are cool season and warm season crops. If you live where you have mild winters, no snow, no freezes, maybe just a little bit of frost, the time to plant your cool season crops is in the fall and they grow throughout the winter. If you do live in cold winter climates where you have snow and freezes, then you want to wait until late winter, early spring. We'll discuss the exact time on the next video. Um, and then you grow those cool season ones, kind of overlapping the warm season that you would grow in the midsummer to early fall. Just letting you know in advance, and I will put a list in the video description of the cool season and warm season crops so you know which ones you're going to be planting. Now, the easiest way to get free seeds is just saving the seeds from what you grew last year. However, if you're a new gardener, that's not possible. But I will be doing a video later in the season to show you how to save seeds from all different kinds of crops. Then you'll be ready for the end of this season, which will give you free seeds for next year. There are a few places that you can get free seeds. The first place would be to look up a seed swap in your area. You might find those on Facebook or just Google them. Um, now, seed swap generally means that you go and take seeds you have and you swap just like trading cards with other gardeners. Now, gardeners tend to be very friendly and giving people. And so I'm pretty sure if you were a new gardener, they would give you seeds anyway, even if you didn't have some to swap. Another great way to find free seeds is to look up a local seed library. Now, if you're like my town, um, it was at the book library and it was just a seed library. You go and they have all kinds of seeds, like in a catalog, card catalog type of thing. And you pick the ones you want. And then they suggest that you save your seeds and bring them back next year to share with others to add to the library, which again, I'll be showing you how to do that. If you're looking to get your garden growing as fast as possible, I have a video right here that shows you 10 of the fastest crops you can grow. I'll see you guys next time.